Thank you, guys. Thanks for everybody that did come out to this particular session. I think that it's one of the more important topics that can be discussed um, with, with the group uh, that's here at Hot Firm because so many people are at that ownership level. And it is such a struggle for so many firms to execute the internal transaction um, successfully. So real quick, I'm Will Swearingen. We have three fantastic panelists today. They're all experts in, in a variety of transition uh, mechanisms or vehicles. And so uh, I'll introduce them here in just a little bit. But want to talk a little bit about what uh, an internal transition or a typical internal transition should look like in an AE firm. And it's, it's actually quite simple. You have uh, a seller and or group of sellers and a buyer and or group of buyers. And, and the difficulty comes in the fact that people don't prepare for the inevitable transition. Um, so often we go into firms where there's a 65 or 67 year old that's got like three or four million dollars worth of equity or value built up that they're expecting to be able to transition over like two years. Uh, and they haven't identified people, they haven't built trust in their organization. And so these, these are the things that create uh, real issues uh, for these types of internal transitions. I mean, outside of not being prepared, uh, there's just some real natural elements that get, that get in the way, and that's the greed factor, the ego factor, um, and then just the lack of ability to cede control to someone else. Oftentimes, owners have been in control of their own destiny for decades. They've written their own paychecks, they've had control over any and all decisions inside the firm. And so that giving that piece up is, is such a, a difficult thing for people to do um, and really to even think about it proactively. And so that's where some of the issues really come up. Uh, J.J. Kale wrote a song, uh, it was called Money Talks, and there's a lyric in it, and it's uh, Money Talks, and it says strange, strange things. And, and it really does say strange things to these people. Um, when you see a half a million or $3 million staring you in the face and you have your partner that you've worked with for 15, 20 years on the other side of the table that you're trying to negotiate, what is the value uh, of this firm? What is the value of my interest? And what are you gonna pay me for it? Um, so the conversations can break down pretty quickly. Um, and if it does get to that point, there are alternatives. Um, if you can't successfully do this, internally. Uh, there's a lot of different options and that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, and so real quick, I want to introduce these guys. We have uh, James Swabowski here with Wintrust ESOP Finance. We have Bo River with, or Bo Sutton with Bo River Capital. Uh, and we have Don Alford with NV5. Don uh, has been a huge part of NV5's growth. And if you guys are aware, they're the two-time back-to-back repeating champs here at the hot firm AE. Uh, industry awards. So I'm going to pass the mic to these guys and let them uh, introduce themselves. So we'll start with James. That's a really big picture. Uh, <laughs> Jim Swabowski, uh, I'm with Wintrust. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with Wintrust, uh, we are a commercial bank headquartered out of Chicago. If you're a baseball fan, you can see uh, we, we're very big in the baseball market in Chicago, particularly with the Cubs. Um, but we're really excited to be here today. Our practice is dedicated on a national basis um, with ESOP Finance. So we very much take a, a little different approach than many other lenders out there. Um, we're very much a consultative relationship-based uh, uh, organization made up of a lot of different niche lending groups to really add value. Ours being ESOPs is something we live in every day. And again, very excited to be here. Good morning, everybody. My name is Bo Sutton. Uh, I'm with Bow River Capital Partners, which is a private equity firm based in Denver, Colorado. Um, <clears throat> as I think we'll talk about over the next hour, obviously there's lots of options that owners can consider and think about when it, as it relates to kind of ownership transition. And private equity is one of those options that I would be representing here today. So looking forward to telling everybody a little bit about how that would work. Uh, a little bit about our firm, it was founded in 2003. 
Uh, we basically are in the business of raising equity from high net worth investors as well as institutional investors. And so our business is going out and finding companies that we can come in and partner with. And uh, not to get too much into the specifics, but we will generally take a controlling uh, interest in a business and we always back the existing team. So as compared to other options out there, our, our whole pitch is, hey, we wanna partner with you, we wanna help you grow, we wanna supercharge your growth and help you think about strategic things like getting into new service lines or you know, adding new geographies, things like this. So um, I've been at the firm for about six years now and uh, looking forward to the discussion this morning. Good morning, my name is Don Alford. I'm with NV5, and I'm responsible for the M&A activities at NV5. Uh, our company was started in 2010. Uh, this year, by the end of this year, we'll, we'll pass uh, 400 million in, in revenues uh, with about 2,500 employees and about 120 offices. So uh, we uh, are a publicly owned company. We did an IPO in um, 2013. So uh, I'll get, a, get an opportunity to explain uh, how that uh, uh, be, being a publicly owned company has, has worked for us uh, during the course, over the course of the last eight years. Great, so we have a few data points here just to kind of provide some context for the conversation and, and really where the industry is as far as ownership and ownership transition. We asked uh, over 150 owners this last year on what their top business issue was. Um, no surprise that recruitment retention is at the top of the list. I'm pretty sure we've heard that over and over and over again. Um, growth in the management of that growth was number two. And then number three was ownership transition and whether that's cleaning up the balance sheet, initiating discussions with internal staff that can potentially get a little bit sticky. Um, these were the top business issues that firms were dealing with, or that owners were dealing with. When you look at the age of ownership in the industry, nearly a quarter of them are over the age of 60. These are the ones that are coming to us and saying, hey, how do we develop a plan to transition ownership? Uh, well. We're really glad that you came and talked to us, but you know, 10 years ago might have been a, a great time to start this conversation as well, but we'll, we'll have the conversation now. Um, I think around 70% are over the age of 50, so it just shows that over the next decade, there's gonna be a lot of activity and a lot of turnover in the industry, um, so a lot of opportunity. Nearly a third are either currently transitioning or will be transitioning over the next three years. So again, just speaks to sort of the, the volume of transactions that will be happening. Uh, and over the next 10 years, around 80% of owners will be transitioning or thinking about transitioning out of their firms. The preferred method uh, of transition in an AE firm is internally. I think around 65% this last year said that that, that was the preferred method. Um, selling for the highest price actually took a little bit of a dip along with selling externally um, as the preferred method, not to say that that's not on the table at all times. Um, interestingly, ESOPs uh, kind of ticked up over the last few years, that was around 7% in 2016, and it's around 20% this year. So it'll be interesting to hear what James has to say about why ESOPs have, have grown in popularity in the industry. Um, is your ownership worth more than when you bought it? 95% said yes. It's, it's kind of a no-brainer to make that investment when someone presents you with that opportunity. Um, I know my 401k is like, at, it's like flat right now, and the market's supposed to have been booming, but I, I don't know how my 401k is at like 1% growth. But uh, in the industry, or as an owner in the industry, you really have some control over your own destiny and what that value looks like. Um, the risks versus the rewards, again, this kind of speaks to how profitable or how... Uh, 
good becoming an owner in an AE firm can be for an individual. 51% said that the rewards and risks were well balanced because there are a lot of risks depending on how the transaction uh, is set up, how it's financed, and how much cash someone had to bring to the table, how much is coming out of their paycheck. Um, these are just some of the risks that are associated with coming into that kind of a position, along with uh, all the other issues and th that come along with becoming an owner in a privately held firm. 43% said that the risks, uh, or that the rewards outweighed the risks, and so it really speaks to um, how good it can be for someone to do that. So I really just kind of want to open it up for conversation here. And maybe, Jim, you can start it off and talk a little bit about why ESOPs have, have grown in popularity over the last few years. Sure. Um, you know what, it's, I think I'm going to have to reach out to this Y team after because there's a lot of slides that really speak our language. And I was really uh, uh, encouraged when I saw the, the trend lines of ESOPs going up. Um, you know, we heard a lot of great things while we're here. We've got a chance to connect with quite a few of you. Um, and, you know, one of the main reasons we're very excited to be here is firms in this space are very much culturally aligned with those of ESOPs. Start with the broad-based broad ownership. And when I say that, what we see more frequently in this space, talking about internal transactions, it's not necessarily one or two main owners or folks that have ownership. It's spread throughout the management team. The challenge that's happening in the space is that for new, new management or employees or to recruit employees, for them to come to the table with a paycheck, or I'm sorry, come with a check that continues to grow is becoming more economically unfeasible for folks to buy in and get ownership that they're looking for. Um, but you have the mindset of acting like owners. And so, and you have folks that want to act like owners. And so what we see and is an ESOP is a great way to allow to really cultivate that mindset. Uh, yesterday, listening to Chad's state of the industry, you know, you could see the targeted challenges really surrounded people. And I'm sure, you know, I'm preaching to the choir with that, but, you know, how do you recruit them? How do you reward them? How do you retain the good ones? And without ownership or some sort of equity stake, it becomes more and more challenging. So, you know, we see ESOPs, you know, we see very often as a way, as succession planning, maybe as an owner as the ability to, to diversify their personal assets, but there's a lot of other great things that come from an ESOP. Um, you know, we always say the R's, like I said, recruit, retain, reward, but it solves a lot of issues too for companies that, you know, somehow evolve into maybe a have versus have nots. Or there's, there's also some sometimes distraction created by this pool of owners that are nearing a retirement event and those that may be younger saying, well, what's our destiny? What's our future? They're gonna, you know, we, we like this culture. We don't wanna go somewhere else. And so solving with an ESOP allows that management team to stay in place. They don't have to exit the company, but what they can do is really set their destiny in the form of an ESOP. And what we love about ESOPs, and you know, hopefully uh, I can see some familiar faces that were at our presentation yesterday getting into some of the more nuts and bolts of it. But what the ESOP really does is it's a very flexible tool that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. It's something you can ease into and allow the management team to really put a plan in place for maybe some succession with management. Um, you know, the other piece that you know, I, I can't understate is that there are significant tax advantages that go along with an ESOP. Um, and we view that as, as a very powerful tool for companies that are looking to grow, not only with just attracting new talent, but maybe attracting companies in the M&A world to start acquiring. When you have enhanced tax or en enhanced cash flow because you're not paying Uncle Sam as much as your peers, it gives you the opportunity to go after something that maybe your, your competitors may not have the ability to go after. So, I mean, imagine sitting in front of someone, uh, you know, a key piece of talent that you can offer them that benefit that your competitors can't. Or imagine your clients and their interaction with your company knowing that they're dealing with an employee owner. I think they're going to feel more comfortable and they're going to feel like they're, gonna, they're working with someone that it, it really takes pride in what they do. So, you know, again, hey, I've said this yesterday, I'll say it a million times, an ESOP is not for everyone. But I do think, especially in the environment that's created in this space, I do think it's one that should be evaluated at some point in time to see if maybe it's a good fit uh, for what you're looking to accomplish. 
So um, maybe the best way to do this is just to give everybody an overview of exactly how uh, a partnership with a private equity firm, and specifically Bow River, may look. Um, <clears throat> like Jim said, there's not necessarily a wrong or right answer with any of this. There's just different options. So uh, Bow River, we have a strong focus on partnering with engineering firms. Um, we have three in the portfolio right now. We, we've partnered with a company called RailPros, which is actually just down the street here in Grapevine. We've partnered with a company called Ely & Associates, which is down in Houston. And they have a team of about 100 petroleum engineers that do hydraulic frack well optimization. Uh, we partnered with a wastewater treatment company, a power engineering company. This is really a space that we know and love. And the, the reason that owners typically partner with us is two different scenarios. One, it's, a, it's an aging founder who is, or founders who are looking for some sort of liquidity event but maybe aren't ready to just completely check out and go to the beach. Or two, uh, there's, there's younger founders who are saying, you know what, we know our craft, we know the technical ins and outs of how to do this work just as good as anybody, but we've never really been business owners or taken a company to the next level before. So, you know, maybe we're at 25 million, maybe we're at 50 million, maybe we're at 75 million of revenue, but we need help thinking through, you know, what's the best way to scale a business? What's the best way to retain and incentivize and recruit? What's the best way to get into new service lines? How do we do add-on acquisitions? We've never done any of these things before. How can we think about the big picture here so that in three to five years, you know, we today set a strategic plan and vision for where the company is going, and we can execute upon that. So in either one of those scenarios, what we'll do is we'll come in, we'll buy somewhere generally between 60 to 80% of the company. And that allows the, the owners to take a pretty meaningful liquidity event, but it also keeps everybody um, with skin in the game, which is really important for us. As you can imagine, partnering with so many different types of firms, um, we are not engineers. We do not have the ability to drop in and run these businesses. We always joke with our partner companies that we or you have already forgotten more about your business than we'll ever learn. And that's not a slight to us. That's just you know recognizing the fact that you guys are truly the experts here. So what we'll do is is try to come in and get involved at the strategic and board level. So you know we'll have quarterly board meetings. Um, but we are there to back you and back the team that you've built. So in terms of things like culture, process, brand name, we're, we're there to help. Um, how can we you know, collaborate to go figure out what are some other businesses in maybe other parts of the country that we could go partner and buy and make you know, your business bigger? How can we get into new geographies? What are the best service lines to add? Um, you know, all of these types of things are, are the ways that we try to be helpful and collaborative. But um, you know, at the end of the day, th the way our business works, um, we have our own masters, so to speak. We have our own investors. And so the time horizon is something that you would want to think about as an owner as well. If you partnered with Bow River, um, our investment period would generally be three to five years. So if we came in, we bought 70% of a company, um, our goal would be to help you double or triple the size of your business over the next three to five years. And then at some point, we're going to have another transaction, another liquidity event, whereby the amount of equity that you retained, that rollover equity, so to speak, could be monetized again. And one of the really interesting things that we found is that, um, you know, say a ownership group retains 25%. That's not an uncommon number. When we go to sell three to five years down the road, that rollover equity ends up being worth more than the 75% that was monetized at the outset, just due to the you know, supercharged growth that's happened during the interim period. Um, and so anyways, it, it's a great model. It's something that uh, we believe in strongly. And uh, one of my favorite parts about this job is working around and with um, you know, people who had the guts to take the risk and, and really build a business. Um, that, that to me is the most interesting and fun and rewarding part. So. I'll stop blabbing and, and give it over to Don. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. <laughs> a, a lot of the, the uh, motivation and, and uh, way that uh, the private equity buyer is, is looking to, to, to get involved with with uh, a company being acquired is is really the same approach 
and desire that, that we have. Uh, the reason that we did an IPO, and we were very small at the time that we did it, and a lot of people said that we were crazy to do an IPO because of the costs that are involved in, in meeting all of the, the requirements. But the, we, there were basically two reasons. One was to raise money that we could use to grow the firm, but the other reason was to create partners. And a, a vehicle that was, was liquid that we could use in, in, our, in our transactions to bring in selling shareholders who were not ready to check out and go to the beach, who, who wanted to come on board and, and be, become our partners going forward with the same skin in the game that we had, which is, you know, I just heard that, that uh, uh, idea uh, e expressed. And so, you know, we're thinking, thinking along the same lines, and what's really neat about it has been that um, our IPO stock price in 2013 was $5 a share plus a, a, a $1 warrant, so effectively maybe $6 a share. And the stock now is trading at around $90 a share. So there has been tremendous uh, upside that our partners have been able to realize. And, and uh, it um, has, in fact, in, in many cases, uh, that, that upside has been greater than what the original transaction uh, uh, totaled. Uh, typically, we, we try to um, get our sellers to take uh, about 20% of their proceeds in the form of, of our stock. And, you know, we a little bit more, a little bit less. It's, we're not really cast in stone on that. And the idea is not to try to conserve cash by doing this, but, you know, once again, to, to, create, to create partners that uh, have the same skin in the game that, w that we have uh, going forward. Um, the other thing that we've been able to do because we, we have this uh, publicly traded stock is, is we, we, we include in, in every transaction and in, in most cases it comes out of our side of the deal. It doesn't come out of the proceeds that, that the selling shareholders get. But um, sometimes we have to use it to bridge a gap uh, in valuation. But uh, we, we, we have a, a what we call restricted stock. And that stock is, is restricted in the sense that there's a vesting period that's attached to it. It's not like the stock that the selling shareholders get, which is theirs. But um, there's a, typically a uh, three-year vesting period. And we give that stock to uh, key people in the, in the new company who are coming on board that didn't participate in the, in the transaction. And it's been a, a, a very effective tool because you know, everybody knows when you, oh my God, the company's being acquired, you know, uh, I, gotta, I, I gotta get out of here, you know, I, I liked it the way it was and all that. Well, this sort of locks people in for, for a period of time, it gives us a chance to, to prove that, um, you know, maybe life's not gonna be all that horrible going forward. And uh, now uh, we've created a whole nother group of, of partners uh, that um, are, are, part of, are part of our team, hopefully, for an extended period of time. We also use this restricted stock in our bonus program. And so we have a way of, of uh, continually increasing the stock ownership that, that uh, management and key people have in, in the company. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's proven also to be a great uh, mo motivating factor. And of course, you know, it's pretty easy 
to get people to take the stock when the stock is, has been performing in, in a, uh, a very positive manner. But still, it's uh, something that, that I think has, has, has really solidified the company and, and helped us through the transitions that are involved with uh, acquiring new companies. Sure, good question. So it, it's a great question. Uh, you know, just to repeat that, how, how do you, as a private equity firm, think about retaining and uh, recruiting for you know your top managers? What what typically happens after you transact? Uh, for us at Bow River, we understand that the reality is these are not manufacturing businesses where the assets are a bunch of equipment and inventory. The assets are your people. They go up and down the elevator. And, I, and as I said, because we recognize that we are not the people who can do the day-to-day -day management and ownership here, uh, we want to do everything that we possibly can to retain those folks. And so generally what happens, um, like Don alluded to, if there's some you know, whispers internally of, oh my gosh, there's some sort of merger or acquisition that's about to happen, what does that mean for me? Our whole pitch to owners is, listen, um, your day-to-day -day is not really going to change. You can tell that to all of your employees. We're not, you know, Jacobs, we're not AECOM, we're not trying to change the branding, we're not trying to change the culture, we're not trying to change the process. We're, we're here to help. And so what we'll do is, more often than not, we will have a, uh, basically an offsite with the whole company within a week or so of closing, where we'll basically go through and spend a few hours talking about, hey, here's who we are, Here's what we do. Here's how we want to help you. And, and guess what? This is good news for everybody. Nobody's job is on the line. Nobody is going to get fired. We're not you know, making dramatic overhauls in terms of the way the business is run. And so um, you know, everybody's always on edge at first, right? I mean, it's just, it makes sense. It's what happens. But in our experience, I don't think we've ever had any sort of exodus of key employees or even you know, lower or middle level employees following a transaction. Um, and part of the reason for that is, is we think about things the same way that, that Don said. We want complete alignment. So in the example of maybe there's one, two, three owners that are the selling shareholders, um, we also will think about things like incentive equity so that we can give you know, the next layer down, maybe the next 10, 20, 30 folks an opportunity to shift their mindset from collecting a paycheck every two weeks to, hey, now, I, now I'm an owner. Now I'm creating value and I get to participate in the economic exit, upside that I'm helping to create. Uh, one of the other things that we do that we found is, is really powerful for further aligning interests is we'll go to that, that next layer in conjunction with the, the ownership and management group that's there already and say, hey, who are your most important and key employees that you can just not afford to lose? And they'll you know, generally identify five, 10, maybe 15 folks. And we'll go to them and say, hey, uh, if you're interested, we would love for you to participate and invest cash equity in the business. You don't have to. It's not a requirement. If you don't, it's, it's no problem. Um, and the reason is not because we need the money to do the deal. But if that individual says, hey, I want to invest 20K, that may be a very meaningful amount of equity to them. And if all of a sudden they are now thinking like owners, that alignment and shift of mindset is, is enormous. And so we want everybody together rowing in the same direction. And uh, so anyways, to answer your question, Will, in, in our experience, we actually, we don't have turnover um, really at all associated with transactions. And I, I would say that's, that's due to the thoughtfulness and approach that we generally take with management, which is recognizing that it's a, a critical issue and, and dealing with it and structuring it in a way and communicating it in a way that is positively received by everybody at the firm. And, and generally, we find that post-transaction, people actually end up being more energized and fired up. Um, oh my gosh, you guys are, are here to help. Um, now, all of a sudden, that competitor that we've been you know, bumping up against down the street, we could go buy them. Um, now, all of a sudden, we're thinking about, hey, you know, what are the best systems that we can use to enable our service offering? Are there different ERPs that 
you know, we, we can help implement? Are there better processes? Is there more management infrastructure that can help make people's jobs easier? And so all of that to say, um, we, we don't find that it's actually an issue as much as you might think. Sure, good question. So just to make sure I heard you right, um, basically what are the financial objectives, both financial growth as well as margin that basically we would use as criteria, right? So for us, um, with this fund that we're investing out of, which is a $260 million vehicle, we're looking to partner with companies that have anywhere from 10 million of revenue on the low end up to 100 million of revenue on the high end. And that's at the date of our investment. Hopefully when we sell together in five years, we're 200 or more, right? Um, it all just depends. But um, it, it is a good point. We are looking for companies that we see a tangible path towards growth. Um, ideally, they've been performing you know, somewhat nicely in the past, even prior to us taking a look at the business, right? So um, I would say that there's no hard and fast rules. If there's a company that's been demonstrating five to 10% plus revenue growth in some sort of sustainable period, that is, that's really interesting to us. Um, I mean, we've seen companies and partnered with companies that have been 30% a year for 10 years. So if we can find those, um, we're all over it. But the reality is that that's harder to come by. Um, in terms of the margin and, and EBITDA, um, if everybody doesn't know, EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And, and the idea is it's supposed to be a, a proxy for cash flow. It's not a very good one, but we don't need to get into that. Uh, we generally look at businesses at kind of a threshold floor that have a 10% EBITDA margin is really what we need to get us excited. So most businesses that we partner with are between 10 and 25% EBITDA margin. Sure. Sorry, guys. It's not my fault. I'm, I, I'm being asked the questions here. Um, so we've invested in over 50 different businesses in the last 15 years, and we've had one company that did not work. Um, our, our strategy and style, and one of the stereotypes about private equity is that there's a firm like us that's going to come in and strap an enormous amount of leverage on the business to help fund the acquisition. We don't do that. We do use some modest amount of leverage. Um, for us, that means two to three turns of, of EBITDA. Um, and what that means is if your EBITDA is $10 million, we'll generally bring 20 to 30 million of debt to help finance the transaction. We don't do more than that because in our experience, almost everybody in this room probably doesn't have debt on their balance sheet already. So the idea of going from zero to 20 million is a horrific idea. Um, but the reality is, that's actually really conservative for the industry. And the ability to meet debt service payments and all of that is actually enormously easy. That's an extremely conservative ratio. So I think part of the reason we've been so successful is because we don't try to create value by financial engineering. We try to create value through this true partnership and the fact that, hey, we've seen 50 plus different businesses grow and scale and the growing pains they experience and the challenges they see with the different systems that they have in place, the challenges that they see with the management infrastructure, the, the opportunities. Uh, so we're able to bring a lot of that insight. And I would say that on average, um, you know, most companies we're involved with is anywhere between three and seven years. And out of the 50 that we've, um, you know, partnered with, there's only been one that hasn't worked. And, and I would actually, I would add to that, and this is, this is a you know, self-serving comment, but we, we frequently have it happen that after the second liquidity event, so five years down the road, those, uh, those partners that experience you know, another check, another event, 
end up becoming investors with Bow River going forward, um, which to me is the ultimate testament of we know you, we like you, we see value in, in the way that you guys work, and uh, we're, we're so excited about that. We're willing to put our money where our mouth is and, and become partners with you in a different capacity. Well, it's, it's very different. Uh, most of the transactions that we have done have been with private ownership. And, and, and then what our preferred structure uh, typically falls into uh, a breakdown of about 50% uh, cash at closing uh, thirty percent seller financing guaranteed no no conditions on the payment of that money but pay, paid in cash over a three to five year period and about twenty percent in the form of of our our stock uh, and that structure has has worked very well for us and and uh, I think the, it's no big secret, but the, what we found is that, that the idea of, yeah, you've got to give your seller a, a nice uh, liquidity event on the front end, but you also want to keep that seller's attention uh, for a reasonable period of time, and if we, we owe that seller 30% of the deal and we're paying it over four years, well, you know, we definitely got their, their, their attention with, with that. And then, as I've said earlier, we, we also um, uh, asked that uh, they take uh, uh, t t about 20% of the deal in the form of our stock. So now they're our partners. We've done... Um, one transaction that was an ESOP company, and we've done one transaction where the seller was a private equity firm, and that's out of uh, 41 transactions. So uh, this is a you know a, uh, definitely a, a, a minority of um, the the uh, the transactions that we have concluded. Um, those deals are entirely different. And private equity is not going to allow us uh, the, the luxury of making payments over a, uh, a ma nor is an ESOP. That, that doesn't work either. Private equity's not interested in taking any of our stock. So what happens in, in um, in those type of transactions is it's basically an all cash uh, at closing situation. You can get a little bit of a, a hold back for maybe specific reasons, but it's got to be a pretty much uh, a, a totally upfront deal. And, and so we've got to really want that, that um, that transaction to go forward on that basis because it's just not the way that, that we typically like to do things. The other uh, difference, too, is that um, on, in a private deal, the, the uh, uh, buyer will get reps and warranties with a, an indemnity period within which they can uh, seek claims under those reps and warranties. Well, you, you just don't typically get that kind of, you don't get the, the amount of time that you, that you can get with a private seller, and you don't have as much uh, of uh, freedom with the, with the reps and warranties that you get. So from the perspective of a buyer, it's a, uh, a much, uh, 
uh, it's a much tighter deal, and uh, for that reason, uh, it's probably uh, a riskier uh, transaction that that uh, you're forced to uh, go go into. I don't know whether you guys, you know, whether you you feel the same way or not, but uh, uh, you know that's that's been our experience. Well, we don't typically like to put any kind of earnouts in 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 our deal because we want partners and and we just think that it, it's if you put an earnout in the in the transaction, then it's them against us, you know, right from the get go. Um, and what happens if they don't make the earnout? You know, that's that's not a good scenario either that creates uh, hard feelings now we have done in some cases a very short-term um, revenue target that we say okay well we'll give you this if if your revenues for the by the end of this year are at a certain level um, and and we set that target at a very conservative level because we want them to make it and uh, but you know we don't typically uh, like to get involved in any kind of um, a device that uh, prevents us from paying the full amount that we agreed to to the seller or certainly uh, going back against them for something. Now we have the reps and warranties. If there's some kind of misrepresentation or fraud or you know. Uh, uh, a situation like that, but thankfully, um, uh, in um, 41 deals, we've never had to um, go down that that path. So, so how are you guys? Do you do an earn out at all? It's unusual for us to do an earn out. Um, <clears throat> we, as, as many people in this room probably know, do an extremely thorough due diligence process. So we've sent in a SWAT team of accountants to kick the numbers. We feel good that, hey, there's a third party who's told us that this is what the, the financial profile of the company is. We don't have clawbacks. We, it's probably one out of 10 deals that we will do some sort of earn out. And um, as, as everybody's probably familiar, that's just in those scenarios where the seller says, well, we're, we're worth, worth 50. And we say, well, you're worth 45. And the seller says, well, look, we're going to have a great year next year. And we're like, OK, well, great. If and when you do, then we'll pay the other five. But that's not common. Um, we, as I say, one in ten is probably the the frequency. So I'm I'm trying to put myself all at home with the age economy or if it continues on this path. But I'm curious. We're likely going to recession and not the future of the future. And if your share prices aren't as much money, or you can't double or triple the revenue in three years, or the, the valuation of the company is is half. How does that? Who do you want to answer that? Sure, I'll go really quick and then hand it off to my colleagues here. Uh, the, the beauty of um, you know an ESOP model or a private equity model is that because there's not a public market that you're reporting to every quarter, you know we understand and candidly expect that if we're investors and in businesses, the reality is sometimes they're going to go sideways for whatever reason, and maybe not sideways, but to your point, if the economy slows down, there's a limit to how much this trajectory can continue going up into the right in terms of the financial performance, right? So we are 100% OK and on board with that. And the, the beauty of partnering with a group like us or doing an ESOP model is 
you're, you're much more long-term thinking. So, hey, th this is a blip, this happens, you know, the economic cycle has been going on for hundreds of years, this is no different. Um, we're gonna weather it, we're gonna get through it together, it's not the end of the world. Maybe in the meantime, there's things that we can be doing, maybe this is a great opportunity now that prices are depressed for us to be going out and being more acquisitive and buying smaller companies. Um, and sometimes if we do hit a recession, what that will do in terms of the partnership is perhaps prolong it. Um, we have, our, our funds are 10-year vehicles, and so in the event, you know, we're in a recession, we do have time to wait. We're not gonna sell when it's not optimal. Um, we can wait for three, five, seven, nine years if we need to. So for us, I would say it doesn't actually impact things, and, and that's just due to the long-term way we view things. You stole a lot of my thunder, but from the ESOP perspective, you're creating your buyer, right? So um, it does affect the fair market valuation, certainly. And, um, you know, on an annual basis, the company does get valued for purposes of of stock allocations and such. So um, usually in those scenarios, I mean, we just lived it, we just saw it, you know, if you go back five or so years ago, well, maybe a little bit further, but, um, you know, a lot of the employees feel it and know it. And so what we've seen, and there's a lot of studies, and I always put the asterisks there because they're funded by a lot of pro ESOP associations, but they did look at these firms during this recessionary period and looked at the, you know, the layoff rate. They looked at the performance compared to peers. And what was interesting from the results um, is that ESOPs did perform better than their peers during that period of time because of that employee owner mindset. Um, and so I'm sure they're talking about it right over there as thinking like an employee owner that's going on right now that session. But, um, but it certainly does. And I can tell you, you gotta get in front, you have to deliver a share price to your employees in those periods, and they may say, wow, you know, we, we actually lost value in the plan. Well, this is a benefit to us, and we lost. Um, but, you know, there are certainly talking points and probably expectations going into that as to what they're going to see. But, you know, again, the, 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 one of the beauties of the ESOP is you are actually creating the buyer. I think that w one of the ways that we hope we could insulate ourselves uh, in, in the event of a slowdown the economy is that we're like 80, 85 uh, percent public uh, projects or quasi-public, and I mean by quasi-public, uh, health care, education, uh, utilities. We're, we, it's, sometimes it's very enticing to uh, look at some of the opportunities in the private market because the the the, the returns are uh, and the margins are are better than they typically are in in, in the, with with public work, but you know we all we saw what happened in 2007 through 2009 to the private market, and the public market kind of hung in there, you know, things slowed down a little bit, but it, it hung in there. And w so that's, that's where we've kept our focus. And um, I, I don't see us changing that uh, here any, any, anytime soon. Uh, you know, it, it might surprise you, but the focus internally is on organic growth. It's not on acquisitions. I mean, I'm involved with the acquisitions. There's, we have a, a due diligence and integration team on the corporate level that's involved with it, but you go out and you talk to uh, people in, in operations, um, they'll, they'll tell you they, they don't even uh, think about the fact that that um, that we're a publicly traded company, because what's being preached uh, just constantly in 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 meetings throughout the company is a real uh, important measurement 
of, of how we're doing is our organic growth. And so the, the uh, uh, Id idea that, that um, uh, we would veer away from that and, and, and focus on acquisitions and go into the, the uh, holding company kind of a, a, a model is, is, is not, not at, at all the case. We, um, the one thing that's different with us, or I would say it's not different with us, but that what we do with the integration is we make sure that, that the leadership of the integration is being done on a collaborative basis and, and on a very, um, un, uh, un, in, uh, not on an invasive basis, and that, that the, the uh, leaders in the company that's acquired are the ones who are actually doing the leading that, that, that process. And, and each one is different. I mean, some, in some cases, you know, the brand, the ultimate goal is that the brand of MV5 um, will, will be the eventual uh, outcome. But whether that happens in six months, 12 months, two years, it really depends upon what makes sense in that, in that particular case. I mean, we still, we have a couple of companies now that are, are still uh, operating under their legacy names. I mean, you know, we're, we're on the letterhead with them, but it's, it's their legacy names and there's a reason for that. Sometimes it's legal, sometimes it's, um, you know, because of the, 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 the brand itself, or the, the, the legacy brand. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that it's not to really dodge the question, but it's almost on a case-by-case -case situation where we handle it, handle it differently with different, different companies. But there is a concerted effort to integrate everybody. There's, you know, with the focus on organic growth, the cross-marketing opportunities uh, are just uh, really a high priority. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's what the ultimate goal is, is to be a fully integrated company. But the timing on it may vary. Yeah, and I, you know, hate to say it depends, but unfortunately it does really align with the objectives. A very common path we see is there's a business owner, especially in today's baby boomer environment, a business owner says they do see at some point, three, five, seven years, they do intend to exit the day-to-day the -day management, maybe even just be more at a board level or maybe just be entirely removed. Um, you know, and that's the beauty of an ESOP is it doesn't necessarily have to be that. We've seen firms where, you know, we talk very, very much about management with ESOP because you do have to have that depth, especially if it's a succession plan objective. But the ESOP could also be one to help recruit that key management team to really take the company to the next level. Um, and in some cases, it's the, it's the passing of the baton at the time of the transaction. So it really does matter case by case. And the beauty of the ESOP alternative is you can really build around that um, in many cases, depending on the objective. Well, I'll start with the ESOP and pass it along. Um, the, ESOP is per the ESOP purchases shares at what is defined and really defendable as fair market value. 
Um, so, you know, there is an appraiser that comes in, puts a valuation. There is a negotiation that takes place, um, but it's not, there, there cannot be a premium paid for those. Um, what we see in the space is, is a couple ways to enhance the yield back to the selling shareholder. Um, there's, depending on the corporate status of the company, there could be tax benefits for the selling shareholder to potentially defer capital gains tax, which is a material way to look at after tax cash proceeds. Um, there's also the ability, if not going that path, to participate in the ESOP again to get another bite at the apple, as well as things such as warrants and other synthetic equity to really get additional upside in doing it. But um, when you just look at pure purchase price, the ESOP is at fair market value. <clears throat> My answer is strategics can pay the most, private equity can pay the second most, and ESOPs are a third. And everybody views things differently, right? So that's just our opinion. The reason why is strategics, when they looked at buying a business, would be able to quantify synergies, meaning cost cuts, other redundancies that could go away. And so they would say the pro forma numbers after giving effect to some of these cuts are actually a higher profit, so we can pay more based off of that. A private equity firm doesn't look at a platform investment anyways as having synergies, so we're not going to do that. Um, and then in our limited experience dealing with ESOPs, we've found that the value that we've transacted at has generally been higher than the fair market value that's arrived at internally by the ESOP process. We have one, a company under what's called letter of intent right now, and our value that we're ascribing to the business is about two turns of EBITDA higher than what the internal valuation process was. It's different in every situation. Again, that's just my opinion, but that's how I would rank them. Yeah, I... Uh, it just really depends on the on the particular case. Um, every deal is 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 different. We we don't really like to have to value synergies into our valuation. Uh, we prefer to to be able to just look at the you know you look at the company and you it, it sort of um, adjust and normalize the numbers so that. It, it's on a going forward basis, but the idea that, um, you know, we've got to cut 10% of, of the payroll in order to justify the valuation, we've, we've never done that. We just pretty much, you know, there's some things that are going to change. Maybe the owner's compensation, uh, some of the benefits that, that a owner has that they wouldn't get going forward. But other than that, we pretty much just accept the, the P&L the, the way it is and make some adjustments uh, for an, a going forward basis. I think we hit our time.